architecture competitions are one of the best ways to showcase your ideas and skills. I myself participated in loads of competitions when I was in college. But even though a lot of us participate in them, do we really take the time to learn from the entries that came in the top of these competitions? Welcome to the very first episode of the series Award Winning Designs. And in this episode, we are discussing Nucleus, the Hyperloop Desert Campus by Mariana Kabugaira, Begum Aidnolu, and Juan Carlos. The challenge was to create a Hyperloop Desert Campus, and the entry Nucleus was one of the finalists. Let's find out what made their design stand out and what was the process they followed to achieve this fantastic design. Now, before I start the interview, I wanted to let you know that you can support Bless Dark via Patreon. For as little as $2, you can help me create better and better content and connect with industry professionals all over the world to bring you the best and the most innovative of all of architecture and design. So, if you wish to support the channel, you can find the link in the description below. Now, let's start our interview. So hey guys, welcome to the channel. Welcome to Bless Dark and uh, you know Mariana, you've already been here. Uh, I think people, everybody on my channel knows you. Everybody on my channel loves you. So you've been here uh, before. But Juan and Begum, it's your first time on the channel. So welcome. Thank you. Hi, Alicia. How are you? Here to be here. So, you know, one thing is we're all four of us are in different time zones right now. And, you know, uh, this is where I want to start this whole discussion with is you're all from different countries. How do you guys know each other? So we did the RL together. Uh, how long was it? Six years ago? Oh, it, it was six years ago? No way. Yeah, it was yeah, like yeah, four years. years <laughs> really? <laughs> okay. We joined the RL and uh, we did our first workshop together, which was like a month and a half, super intense and crazy. Uh, I don't know who decided to join us specifically. I think it was you, Juan, I'm not sure. And we just started doing uh, one workshop and then we uh, became friends, basically. I think it was just a matter of coincidence. And then we ended up like talking to each other and ended up working together. It was like a good vibe. And we just decided to do that workshop. Yeah, and I think it was interesting that it's almost like the partnership at first sight because uh, I mean, we clicked, I think, from the moment that we have met each other individually with Mariana and Juan. Have you guys also been doing more projects together since then, or this project sort of got you back together after a long time? We are kind of like individually, we were always in, um, in contact, but this was the first time that brought us all together with one project. Exactly, a, a year ago, it was a lot of uncertainty and projects were moving kind of slow in the firm. So I was looking around and I found this great competition that it, it would be like a good opportunity to bring the team back together. Uh, and I just gave them a call and then told them let's do this and they were on board. And yeah, it was basically a good opportunity to work together. So I've broken down our discussion into, into a few parts so that we can understand the project wholly. So, you know, Part one is all about the brief. So let's first understand, let's take a look at the brief. What exactly was the competition asking you to do? The competition was asking from us to, in one sentence, to create a sanctuary of science in the middle, middle of the desert in Nevada that is uh, accommodating hyperloop scientists, engineers, so it's not only um, a science center, but also a residence for them that is uh, imagining the future of how we live, but also how we work, but also how we exhibit through museums and how we are creating all of these program programs all together while being a transfer center for Hyperloop as well. There was one sentence in the brief, which I thought was very interesting. And it said like, it had to be a century of science like a place where the impossible becomes possible. And I think it's, it's a great way to think about this project on, on something that is special, iconic, uh, unique, and that it certainly brings people to start creating and start thinking about the Hyperloop and, and new technologies in a, in a different way. Uh, and I think that for design wise, it was very obvious that they were looking for, uh, they said it quite clear, a landmark. So when we saw landmark, we understood 
we do have to blend in with the with the context, uh, just like most of architecture should. But when they say landmark, it means it has to stand out. Uh, so you have to see it from a distance. It has to become a symbol, uh, not 100% blended with the desert, which was Nevada. So that was something that personally for me, it kind of meant a lot for the how the design develops. All right, um, let's get a little bit deeper into the program. So what all functions did you have to include in the competition? They did, uh, they, actually the way they exposed the program was very clear. Uh, they said you have this unit, that unit, that unit. And in overall they said seven, four units uh, or three units. And it was obvious that they had one very public unit, which was museum um, hall, the main hall and uh, a public tour that should go around all the programs. Then you have one that is semi-private, which is classrooms and uh, laboratories. And then you have one that is a little bit more private, which included like housing for the people who works there for the Hyperloop and uh, uh, offices as well. So that meant that you have all of these spheres working in simultaneous one that is completely exclusive and also include the spa or health center. And then it kind of gradually, it becomes gradually more public and it turns into a museum and like a, a big hall for a main hall to receive people from the outside. So it was very properly explained. And that well. program that they gave us also allowed us to, to understand exactly how each section was gonna be divided to. And yeah, and that basically became the design, trying to figure out how you put those different public or private spaces in different blocks, different units yeah. that talk to each other, but at the same time have this separation. So now before we move into our second part, which is uh, about research and case studies, uh, one thing that I wanted to ask is uh, your workflow. You were away from each other. Obviously you're not in the same space. You're working digitally, but you're also working in different time zones. So how did the rhythm of working with each other set in? Because Again, you're all on different time zones, cycles. Maybe to talk to each other, you had to, you know, give up your sleep cycle so that you could have that discussion that day. How, how was this happening? Firstly, Basically, my... Juan was waking up really early. <laughs> Only Juan, we were chilling. It was like 6 p.m. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it was, the initial conversations were really interesting because we all are very passionate about what we do and we all have our different ideas on how to attack a, pro a problem. So I think those were harder just because as we clashed, as we had those like heated arguments, better ideas came along. And I think that that's the beauty of, of working with people that you, that you think are great at what they do and, and, and can bring a lot of things to the table. So a, 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 like a great amount of good ideas. So Eventually that evolved into the project, but at the, at the beginning, I think it was like a lot of like, you like this, I don't like that, let's do this. And it, was, it wasn't that different at school. So I think we were accustomed to that. We were accustomed to like fighting a lot in the beginning, but then seeing a great outcome. That's so true. I think that was very fruitful in, in the sense that uh, there were lots of disagreements, but at the end of the day, everyone was kind of trying the idea. So it's, it was not only talking. I think that's what's very powerful in the workflow because all of us were kind of trying to have this experiment through the ideas. But also I want to mention that Juan being in the very different time zone than Mariana and us, because Mariana and I in the European kind of time zone, that I think it was also working very well because when we were sleeping, then Juan was kind of uh, having her, his morning. Uh, so that by the time that we wake up, there, there were certain things that that been developed. So it was kind of speeding things up. Uh, yeah. that's, that was very, very useful in that sense. So your project wasn't sleeping even if you guys were? Never. <laughs> Zero. Don't say that. We work for offices. Of course, he was sleeping. <laughs> when we were working for the office, he was laughing. And then... Moving on to part two, which is research and case studies. So uh, after you guys read and understood the brief, what was the first step? What was the step that you took first and how did it all start? We created uh, internal um, initial case studies inspirations meeting without starting the anything related with design. We asked specific questions. We, we extracted every single sentence from the brief and then took our own times, like literally one, two weeks, 
and then we felt the project, then we said, what does speed mean for us, for example? Because the project is all about speed and it's, it's one of the most inspirational factors. And um, I remember Mariana created a, a great presentation that is kind of having all the formal references. So, uh, and then Juan uh, giving all the references about like built examples. So it was, it's, it was all about the key part and how we are feeling the project. Definitely, and, and I honestly think that that idea about speed brought us to the main like design inspiration, which was like the transportation clover, because I feel it was like a, a bunch of like different energies, different speeds, like all clashing into one place. And that definitely gave us the idea of, of how we could make transportation part of the design and at the same time incorporate the rest of the program into it. So. From the point of, view, point of view of design, I was more focused on what kind of words bring, what kind of illustrations in my mind, addressing the fact that we have four units or three units, programmatic units, and addressing all of the keywords that we highlighted, which was desert. Uh, we brought the oasis, which was kind of bringing the natural elements to the desert, so water, green. And the oasis also brought a bit of the circle, the circle uh, condition. And that also made us look into typologies that address a campus that is done in a circular building. So that brings also case studies. So it's important that you bring illustrations, right? All of your creativity comes into like just images, Pinterest, whatever. And then you also look into typologies, what has already been made. That was really important. I think Juan brought a lot of, uh, a lot of that. What has already been made for campuses? Uh, and if there is an oasis, which is typically a circular patch of water, what kind of campus had been made that have a circular uh, typology? So the Google campus was a very obvious um, study for us and obviously we took it on board. Yeah, I think it was very important for us to, to try something different. So all of us typologies made us understand like, we're not doing this, we're not doing this again, we have to try something different. Exactly. And it was, it was not only about being different, but because, you know, like when we were doing the, the initial design, it's like either we're doing something kind of genius or we're doing something that is completely wrong. But, mm -hmm. but I think that like striving and like keeping that focus on what we, on, on the final idea just like made us design something special and different. So let's come to our part three, which is the initial design ideas and 3D massing. So after you've done all of your research, uh, after you identified and looked at case studies, then what is the next step that you did? At this point, was, was your workflow now divided amongst the three of you or was it still moving circularly? What was the next step? I think it was organically divided. We didn't say you only do that, you know? We were open for everything, open for ideas. Everyone could bring some design in. Of course you do what you're like more used to do. In, in my case, I was very used to do design sketches and ideas. So I just jumped into it and then I'll bring the ideas to these guys and we would discuss it. And uh, of course, they if they say we don't like it at all, we changed completely. Uh, so um, in my case, I started modeling right away uh, with the ideas that we spoke. So the oasis, the speed was something that was really important. And then I don't know if you guys remember, it was very important, the tour. Like they had this weird specification, which is a public tour that should loop around all the program, but they cannot look into, I don't remember. There was something specific they couldn't look or there's something they should look. So that kind of drove us also to create a very continuous uh, idea of the project as well. So then I was modeling and then we were meeting and it was like, what do you think about this? And then we would discuss it with passion. Exactly. <laughs> it was it was about understanding like how each program fits in the in the shape that we were kind of trying out at the beginning. So it was like where has the museum has to go? Well, the museum has to go in the center, right? Because everybody wants to look at the museum from different yeah. points of view, like stuff like that that leads you to understand where you can like twist or change the sh the initial shape in order to fit the program. So it was like. At the beginning, you have like this massing, right? The, the clover, the transportation clover that allows like different type of, like, of tours of di directionality, et cetera. And then you start dividing those like little pockets into what you think fits better in the program. 
At this point, what softwares were you working on? So it was a lot of Maya, Maria, Mariana Bego, and like a lot of Maya. And then it was, I mean, to kind of like extract the information, we used Rhino. But the yeah. beginning, like the, the massing was definitely Maya. Would you also say, I mean, the uh, starting with the project, the form of the project was also much more important. Was that your, uh, at this point, were you also looking for creating something iconic? that came out at the end and were you sort of paying attention to that? So I, I, I think, uh, yes, of course, form was important, but we didn't initially started with the form. Firstly, the programmatic layout and the square yeah. meter restrictions were the first thing that was kind of very important for us because there were so many diverse functions that requires different types of privacy. And uh, so there were, as Mariana said, public, semi-public, very private. So the correlation yeah. between them led to the form of the building. So I think that's very important. We tried so many different forms that are cu currently, we didn't end up with. I remember like Mar Mariana and I uh, back and forth, I was taking Mariana's models and then I was trying with them and then I was sending them back to Juan. So that, that was kind of like a, this triangular loop then ended up with something very different as the form. So we didn't start it with the form. Mm -hmm. Exactly, exactly what you said. We had a triangular loop in the beginning because the units were uh, shown to us as three units. So actually function was uh, dictating a lot of the shape, uh, of course. So we thought three units, we need to loop around because it's a tour, it has a public tour. So let's make a tripod. And I was very focused on the tripod and I still like the tripod. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, we bought, we bought a lot of that idea. <laughs> we bought, we bought idea. What's up? What's up? Messages, hate messages. <laughs> no, I, I mean, I fought and, against uh, it then, just because I thought it wasn't iconic enough. I thought it was like, it's done before. Like, there's a couple of examples that I showed Marianne. <laughs> we, we fought. It doesn't mean that you can't do stuff that's already been tried out. Right, but it was—it just wasn't yeah. what what we were expecting, and I think it was a good fight. <laughs> the game changer was we changed from three units to four units, and that made what it looked like a campus more than it was looking more like a landmark uh, that was floating in the air, and then it became a campus because we decided not three units, it's four. So actually, function was dictating a lot of the shape, a lot. Also for us, the the building that doesn't have a start and end point was also very uh, exciting for us that you could experience the building like the same um, same routes but different experience and that uh, if you draw lines between our paths it's it's almost creating the diagram of our building it's 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 the x-ray of our building that is creating the form the loop the 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 paths that you're taking is the DNA of the form, and that's I think very very interesting yeah. about this project. Yeah, yeah. And then like a quick shout out to like I also have my, like my firm in Colombia, which is called Lab Left Angle Partnership, and they also helped us out in a lot of like the information yeah. extraction. So that was great because Lina, like a, a couple of like people from my office worked on it and and helped us like to like the shapes that we tried out. They helped us understand if it worked, if they worked in meters, in square meters, if they were. So that was great as well. Yeah. Hi, Good Lena. Back up. <laughs> Hi, Lena. Thank you, Lena. <laughs> How much did this whole time take? This whole creation of uh, the design from start to finish. I mean, not finished as in completely finished, but a stage where you say now we think about, uh, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. render Most ideas. Product. Yeah, exactly. I think it was like a month and a half, right? I think it was like a month because a half we did post production. Yeah. The true. thing is, um, although we stayed on the tripod for very long, because I was like, okay, but I'm going to keep on both in parallel. So every time we were developing, we was like developing both. Until it's good. Like Mar Mariana week. is stubborn, and I like that because it helps <laughs> you, like, you know. <laughs> It, make, it makes you come out with the you best really you, have to, you, have to, you have to have the right arguments in order to fight, which is great. <laughs> yeah, so then there was, well, I think we said that in this day, uh, Thursday, our meetings were on Thursday, in this day we will decide. In this day, like it has to freeze, it's frozen. And in the, on that day we froze it. And it's like, it's this one. 
but it's important you have to force it even if you're doing your own competitions you have to force that thing. yeah we gave our strict deadlines internally but also once we closed yeah. the 3d model in terms of form then other conversations started as so. plan development and a really spatially des interior design um, problems that we needed to solve uh, because we were envisioning a very transparent but also very private different kind of um, encounters that we wanted to create between people for example when you go to, uh, inside of the building that you go through a very thin corridor uh, but on your upper floor there's this restaurant so everything is kind of uh, very detailedly designed in terms of interior as well uh, so once we froze the model then that uh, 3d 2d back and forth process started before the production okay let's now come to the 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 post production part so first of all is uh, did you guys render the whole thing yourself or did you get it done from somewhere outside i work with with juan estupiñan which is his firm is called metrica um and we've done a couple of projects before and i love the way he, he his approach to to renders to basically <clears throat> visualization overall we work with him in 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 doing this like this is like a special baby for all of us right and even for him because like you're accustomed to render a lot of interiors houses whatever but like this type of projects are something special that you don't get every single day. So Mariana, Begum, like we all decided like this is the concept that we want. These are the cameras that we want. He gave us feedback on those as well. Uh, and we just like started doing a presentation on like we want this exactly like that. And then we want this. exactly, And it helps him like to understand our idea, our vision of the project. But but his input is also great uh, to, to arrive to final uh, great renders let let's just talk about this in general you know how important are the visuals for competition entries you know people a lot of times are able to create beautiful designs beautiful projects but maybe they're not able to create those captivating visuals so how important do you think that is in in any competition entry well, i'm, I'm going to be very honest even in school there's a time that you develop the project and then there's the time that you develop how you're going to show the project and for example, in an office that's very uh, religious, the time that you do the project and the, pro the time you, you do the visualizations for the project, uh, they are as important as the project. And this is controversial. And I think not everyone agrees because the project should be the soul, but not really. The way you're showing your project says everything. So if even I don't think you should develop the whole project, you develop the project that you're gonna show to be honest, unless it's going to be get built tomorrow, which is not, just develop the cameras that you set, like we did, like, right? We didn't develop the whole interiors. We had an idea, the plans were done uh, by, by Left Angle Partnership and, and Bex, but we kind of decided we are just gonna model that shot, that shot and that shot, because we are going to show it in a render here, here and here. So I think that yeah. you should stop your project at some point and then develop production. Definitely. I think you have to pick yeah, yeah. your battles and, and understand that even if you have like amazing ideas, but you're not able to portray them or show them in the in the appropriate way, people are not gonna buy them. So yeah, you know, it, yeah. it's really important to freeze, like understand your cameras, so understand your angles, and just like go to the final detail on that space. But there's no need of doing the whole building to the last nail if you're not gonna show it. So it's really yeah. important to understand. And, and we are definitely a team of fake it till we make it. We are fine with that, all of us three. Uh, and, and that's also something that is important. Maybe you didn't develop the full 3D of that, whatever, living room. You can make a living room in a Photoshop. You don't have to be modeling the living room. Okay, no. so that's how important visualization, visualization is. You don't have to have everything defined. You just have to show it show it good so let's come to the last part which is the presentation board so first of all what was the requirement by the competition did they limit you in terms of boards or what you had to provide yeah there was a limitation and also a package that they required like all the plans all the sections uh, technical details uh, a text uh, to be written uh, with the 
renders and visual representations. So it was all a the scale. Yeah. Also, you had and to then, give everything to them, and you couldn't just yeah, finish but, it off. But then, in the... but then again, yeah. But then again, they say scale one hundred and uh, one five hundred, I think. So you develop the project till the five hundred. Don't develop it further because you're not going to show it. You know what yeah. I mean? So, and, and that has to be a requirement that people have to understand since the beginning, right? Like the scale on how you're going to show it. Because even if you have the whole building and you want to show the everything, you won't be able to show it at that scale. So it's going to ruin yeah. your diagrams and your drawings and everything. So it's really important to keep all of these ideas from the start in order for you to really come up with the best outcome. Perfect. Um... I think I have finished all the questions that I had. Um, is there something, anything specific that you would want to add about the project? Personally, having a firm and, and trying like paying salaries makes you like so far away from these projects and I miss them so much. And I do want to encourage people, like even if they're working and even if they have like no, not a lot of free time, like to really go into these competitions because it, it really frees your mind and makes yeah. you like go into another like dimension and understand that you can do architecture not by just like square boxes is mostly what we do but like understanding just like to like take this free time to like go into these competitions and, and do something special all right i wanted to leave the same the, exactly the same what juan said i think it's major that it's being said like quite often there are less and less excuses for people to join competitions and these are just idea competitions Okay, and we were working from Bogota, London, Istanbul, and we worked for a month and a half, and it was kind of successful, I'd say. So <laughs> there are no excuses. I really think that if you should be, everyone should be joining a, a competition. Me as an employee, Juan as a manager, and Behum as a manager as well, you should be doing competitions on the sides. You can do it. You can manage both. All right, perfect. Uh, at the, before we finish, do you have any uh, advice for people taking Part in competitions i think definitely uh organize your time that's major we scheduled everything remember uh, we did like every week there's a end point there's a goal and then we were just fulfilling these goals every week so time management for me is one of the key points of a competition definitely and just like opening up your mind and like creating forms that are inspirational and different and like that research uh, at the beginning might be kind of weird but it will definitely take you to really cool places I would say and I would say be unique uh, remember that this is not a commissioned work so you signed up for a competition then you should really bring something out of the box to the table and then inspire people all, all around the world because this was not coming from a client which we deal every day in a daily basis. So be aware of that unique situation yeah. and embrace it. All right, perfect. Um, and that was it. Thank you so much guys for, for your time. Thank you guys for such amazing advice. And uh, thank you guys for going into your project in such detail. Thank you, Rashid. Thank you for having us. It was thank amazing. You. Thank you. Yeah. Hopefully we'll see you again soon. For sure. With our next year. <laughs> And that was it you guys, that was the first episode of award winning designs. Do let me know your thoughts on the design and the discussion in the comments below. Give this video a thumbs up and do share and subscribe to Bless Dark for more such content. Also if you wish to support this channel, you can do so through Patreon. The link is in the description below. And that was it, I will see you guys soon for more such content. Bye bye.